presented by Caltech. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to first introduce uh, <coughs> our uh, Sonia and William Davidov Presidential Chair prof and Professor of Physics, or President Tom Rosenbaum. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Gail. Well, it's, it's a great uh, pleasure to welcome you here to a highlight of Teach Week. Uh, in the broadest context, of course, the United States faces an enormous challenge. The world actually faces an enormous challenge in training clever, innovative, transformative scientists and engineers who can make a difference for the next generation, for our generation and the next generation. Uh, in a more narrow context, of course, at Caltech, uh, we have the opportunity to train what we hope will be the leaders in terms of applying quantitative skills to solve problems in all kinds of disciplines. But to do that well, you need a partnership. You need a partnership between the teachers and you need, and you need a partnership with the students. So how many of us remember, and we hope it will be your experience for the Caltech students here, that the way you were thinking about your career is changed by the interactions in a class, in the research lab, with the faculty member, <coughs> with postdocs, with graduate students, with your peers if you're an undergraduate. It can just take, make an enormous change in the way you think about the directions you're going and the inspiration and the pleasure that you get from the career that you are going to launch. Uh, but it doesn't happen by magic, of course. Reminds me of a New Yorker cartoon where uh, you have a little uh, girl sitting on the sidewalk with blocks uh, next to her and another little boy, and she's writing with chalk on the sidewalk. She says, I try to get in a little bit of writing each and every day. <laughs> so it's the same way. You need the diligence to be able to take those lessons, to come to class, if I may say so, even at Caltech, uh, to be able to take seriously the responsibility of engagement. On the faculty side, of course, uh, there is nothing more pleasurable, more rewarding to have your students turn into your colleagues. There is the thrill as well, of course, if you're in the classroom of connecting with your students to seeing them understand, but even more for you to understand the material at a different level. It's a truism, of course, but one actually doesn't understand things very well or venture into new fields without trying to explain the material, without trying to explain the concepts, without that kind of interaction with your colleagues and with your students. Uh, there's a wonderful quote from a 16th century poet, Michelangelo, Bonarati, which said, if you know how much work went into it, you wouldn't call it genius. <laughs> and so there is genius, of course, in terms of being an effective teacher. But it doesn't come by accident. It comes from data, from understanding what works and what doesn't work, from doing experiment. And we have obligations as faculty members to excel in this field as in our basic scientific research. And it's that interwoven whole of research and education that makes Caltech special. So I'm enormously grateful to uh, all of those, and Cassandra and the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Outreach, uh, and the Office of uh, Strategic Initiatives, to be able to put together this set of programs to underscore our desire to make this even more important part of what Caltech is known for. And I'm enormously grateful to Professor Mazur for coming here to share what has been a long program, really, of dedicated scientific research into what kind of education works. So without further ado, let me turn it back to Gil. 
uh, to give you a formal introduction uh, to our speaker. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tom. And uh, now, I guess, on behalf of the physics department, it is a pleasure to introduce our colloquium speaker today, Eric Mazur. Eric is the Balkansky Professor of Physics and Applied Physics, as well as the Applied Physics Area Dean at Harvard. He is a world-renowned uh, scholar and researcher in the field of laser physics, and is also world-renowned in the field of uh, innovations uh, in technologies and strategies for physics learning, and I guess science learning in general. He won numerous awards. I'll just give you a small selection. So he won the, <laughs> the, the Valor Award of the Optical Society and also the Millikan Medal of the American Association of Physics Teachers. And I was uh, told shortly before this talk that he was also the first winner of the NSF Teacher Scholar Award uh, together with Carl Weiman. Uh, if we are seeking any uh, more proofs for his uh, impact on education and science. I also heard that he has, in his career, graduated no less than 120 graduate students. It's just, no, no, no. right? Or 40 graduate students. 40. 45. 45. <laughs> well, my three pale in comparison. <laughs> but apologies for the inaccuracies. He also wanted me to apologize on his behalf for being so well dressed for our colloquium. He was struck by an informality. And he said it's only because he just became the vice president of the Optical Society and came directly from their meeting in San Jose in, in the Bay Area. Uh, so he's here to tell us about his educational uh, innovations. So without further ado. Thank you. So let's get started. When I started teaching at Harvard, now some 20, oh gosh, I don't even know if I want to admit that, 84, so 27, if I'm not too tired, yes, years ago, I never asked myself the question, how am I going to teach? It's kind of strange, right? Because when you do something new in your life, that should be the first question you ask yourself. The question did not come up in my mind. It was perfectly clear, subconsciously it was perfectly clear. I was going to do to my students what my professors had done to me. <laughs> Lecture. I, that was not, you know, because I want to take revenge or anything, no. <laughs> I sort of naively thought, I learned physics in a classroom not very different from this one by sitting and listening to my professor's lecture and therefore I thought that's how one learns and that's how I should teach. There's actually a picture of me as an assistant professor a long time ago. It's a very old picture. It was taken BC, before computers. You see, I'm using an overhead projector as you can see on that picture. Now I realize that my professors taught me the way they did because their professors did. And they probably did it because their professors, all the way back to this guy here at the University of Bologna, this is actually from an illustrated manuscript uh, out of the 14th century from a classroom at the University of Bologna, which is one of the oldest universities there is. And uh, you know, apart from the way the people are dressed, it's not that different from what you see right here, right now, down to some details that <laughs> are very well captured uh, in this uh, illustrated manuscript. Now, you know, what happened was really peculiar. What happened was that, well, first I should tell you that as an assistant professor, I was asked to teach the course that none of my colleagues at Harvard wanted to teach. Physics for pre-medical students. <laughs> this is not funny. I mean <laughs> These were not students who wanted to learn physics. No, they had to learn physics in order to be admitted to medical school. And, and most of them were not very kind to my colleagues in terms of end of semester evaluations. I didn't know any of that. Uh, in Europe, where I'd been educated, we didn't have a difference between physics for pre-medical students. In fact, 
medicine was an undergraduate concentration rather than just a graduate track. But something interesting happened. I actually got very high evaluations, 4.5, 4.8 on a, on a five-point scale. So that's one metric by which I sort of measured my own success. The other is my students' performance on examinations. And you know, in general, I think when physics is taught to pre-medical students, it's an algebra-based course, not a calculus-based course. I never knew of the distinction between algebra and calculus-based, because back in Europe, we don't make the distinction. So I taught these pre-meds a full-blown calculus-based physics course, and I gave them problems on the exams that <laughs> I wasn't sure I would always do well on under the pressure of an exam, but they, by and large, did well. So they liked me as an instructor. They did well on what I, what I considered complicated exam. Obviously, I was doing the right thing. In fact, I very quickly started to believe that I was the world's best physics teacher. <laughs> now, that turned out to be a complete illusion. And you're thinking back, there were always some negative signs. But you see, I'm a positive thinker. So if I get positive signs and negative signs, I ignore the negative ones and I focus on the positive ones. Let me give you some examples. Every year, in spite of giving me high evaluations on my end of semester evaluations, some students would write at the bottom of those sections, or those forums in a, in a comment section, they would write, physics is boring or physics sucks. <laughs> I could never make any sense of those remarks. I mean, what is more beautiful than understanding how the universe around us works? And why were they giving me high ratings but still thinking of the subject of, as being boring? So I just ignored them. Now, the same thing happens when I go to a party and people ask me what I do for a living and I tell them I'm a physicist, you know. Oh, physics. I had such a difficult time with physics in high school or in college. Or my, my dentist, and you know, I was sitting in this chair with the thing in my mouth, I couldn't even talk back. He said, mm, you're a physicist. I got an A for physics in college, but I really didn't understand anything. It always creates this feeling of embarrassment, and I, I never understood why the teaching of science, and physics in particular, creates this resentment among people who do not continue in the sciences. Anyway, I went on for a very long time teaching this way until one day I discovered that I actually wasn't that effective. I'll, I'll tell you about that in, in just a moment. But before we do that, I would like to briefly talk about that picture that's on the screen. Um, I would like you to give me a description, one or two words. I don't want any you know, monologues or anything. Just one or two words representing what is happening there on the screen behind me. And ideally, I would like to hear a verb. But there are two verbs that I do not want to hear, teaching and learning. So you have to come up with other words. So just blurt it out, and I'll repeat it. Broadcast. Listening, broadcasting, like explaining. Monologue. Noting. Noting. Nothing? Noting. Oh, noting, note-taking, yes. More. One Lecturing, one way. Sleeping. Did somebody say sleeping there? <laughs> <laughs> These are my students, you know. <laughs> Reminds me actually of a, um, a quote that has been attributed to Albert Camus, although I don't think it was him. Some people talk in their sleep. Lecturers talk while other people are sleeping. <laughs> Notice that most of the things that we heard that involved verbs pertained either to me or to them. Note-taking, uh, explaining. We were both there at the same time. I'm not note-taking, and the students are not explaining. So how can we capture the whole thing? I think I actually heard it. Uh, the, the verb that I liked the most was broadcasting or transmitting. But what is it that I'm transmitting? What is it? Whatever you're pointing at. No, no, I mean, I'm not asking for subject, but the general idea. Information. Some people sometimes say knowledge, but frankly, I don't know how to 
transmit knowledge. It would be really nice if I could, but knowledge is really something that needs to be constructed by the learner. But the word that we just heard is correct. Lectures focus on the transmission of information. And you know what? My students had pointed this out to me, but I had ignored it. In fact, I'd gotten upset at the students when they pointed it out to me. You see, I just told you that when I started teaching, I never asked myself how I was going to teach. What was the question you think did come up in my mind? Not how, but what exactly? So, or more precisely, what book? So I went to a colleague who had taught the course before, and he told me, oh, in this course, we've used the book by Halliday and Resnick. You know, as the physicists in the audience, and I think there are quite a few physicists here, probably know this book, it's still a classic. Anyway, I was also told by my colleague that I had to make sure that the bookstore had enough copies of the book in stock. Now, coming from Europe, that was new to me. You see, I mean, in Europe, you would never get it in your mind to buy a textbook if the teacher is sort of presenting the content of the textbook to you. You would just take notes and, and reassemble the textbook in your, in your notebook. But anyway, I told the students in the U.S. bought textbooks. So a month before my course started, I went to the Harvard Coop in Harvard Square, which is our bookstore, and I said, be sure that by September 15th, you have 150 copies of Halliday and Resnick in stock. And as I walked back from the Coop to my office, I thought, wait a minute. If the students have Halliday and Resnick, and I have the same book, then what do I do in the classroom? So I went back to my colleague and I asked him that question and he said, oh, don't worry. There are lots of different physics textbooks. And he showed me a shelf full of books that he had collected over the course of his career. And I started looking at the books and very quickly I found the perfect book. It was perfect for two reasons. One, it was different from Helena and Resnick, so at least I was not just regurgitating the content of the book that they had bought. But that was not the important reason. The important reason was the book was out of print. <laughs> so for every lecture, I would spend 10 hours you know, preparing lecture notes, which in class I would either project on the overhead projector or write on the, on the board there behind me. And because my notes were different from the textbook, I prepared copies of the notes so that at the end of each class, the students, when they walked out, could pick up a photocopied set of lecture notes. Now, why do you think that I hand them out at the end of class and not the beginning of class? So that they would pay attention and take notes. But isn't that already admitting that there is a problem? Why force the students to get the information out of my mouth if they could get the information out of the notes? That never came up in my mind. But you know what happened? What happened was that at the end of that year, about half a dozen students wrote in the comment section of their, their evaluations, Professor Mazur lectures straight from his lecture notes. <laughs> Hello? I mean, what was I supposed to do? Develop another set of lecture notes to lecture from that was different from the lecture notes I handed out to them? These ungrateful students. <laughs> but you know, they had a point. I was focusing, I was focusing on information transfer. Now, if you go around the world, around the nation, around the world, and you visit random classrooms, this scene right there is repeated over and over and over again everywhere. In fact, I make a habit of observing classrooms at different universities. The architecture is mostly the same, like this one here. So you could ask yourself the question, I don't think it's a crazy question, is that what education is? Is education merely the transfer of information? After all, if you were coming from Mars or some other planet to study the education habits of Homo sapiens and you observed some classes, that's what you could very quickly be led to believe. So let me ask you, we have these clickers, so we'll use the clickers. It's not what they're meant for, but why, why don't we make good use of them, right? Oh, I see that 33 of you have already been playing with your clicker. 
very good. So let me erase that because this distribution has nothing to do with the question. So here's the question. If you believe that education is just the transfer of information, press 1. If you think that education is more than just the transfer of information, press 2. So go ahead and let's see where we stand. We have 90, 100, I'm going to give you five more seconds. Three, two, one, and here's the distribution. <laughs> Somebody must have their clicker upside down because I see some H and J. <laughs> I'm happy to say that we're quite unanimous, but there are a number of people who pressed one. I have a warning for you if you're a teacher. You're about to lose your job. Because let's face it, let's imagine for a moment that education is just a transfer of information. I, I know we don't agree with that statement, but let's for a moment imagine that that's the case. What would then, if that's the case, what would be the logical thing to do in the 21st century? Be pragmatic, exactly, video record. The best professor in physics, uh, in English, and in Chinese, and in, 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 in some other languages, and put it on the internet. In fact, it's already happening. It's already happening. What would you lose by taking all of the courses, videotaping them, and putting them on the internet? Other than our jobs, of course, but what else? What else would you lose by doing that? Interaction. But how much interaction is there really in a, in a lecture class? I'm working very hard on interacting with you. It's not that easy, right? It's not that easy because of the architecture. Who is responsible for this architecture? Where does it come from? Probably Europe. That's right. But let's be a little, <laughs> let's be a little bit more specific. What is this based on? Greece, the amphitheater. Why did the ancient Greek develop the amphitheater? For? For place, so that everybody could hear and everybody could see, right? Did the Greek ever use the amphitheater, which was really a performance space, as a learning space? No, anybody who studied ancient Greece knows that in the school of Athens, you just walked around and talked in pairs. You combine actually walking and talking with learning. The, Greek, the ancient Greek never used the performance space as a learning space. Somewhere in middle age, mid middle evil, I'm sorry, Europe, they adopted the performance space as a learning space. Now imagine, I mean, think back, I should, mean, I, I should say, of when you walked into this room and sat down. You sat down with the mindset I am going to listen to Eric present, confess, or whatever, present his talk, right? You, you, you sit down with the expectation of listening and observing, not interacting. In a, in a movie theater or theater or concert, it would be disruptive if you just started to speak up. And you bring that same mindset to a lecture. So I think people are turned into passive being as soon as they sit down in a seat in a place designed like this one, focused on the performer in front. In fact, I make a habit of observing some of my colleagues teach in different departments. You know, Steven Pinker, we, we have a lot, I'm sure you have many greats here on campus too, fantastic uh, presenters. And you see the same scene, you see students sitting in their seats, silently observing in a dynamic lecture in front, talking for a few minutes and then stopping and said, does anybody have a question? Anybody? And the students look down because they don't want to make eye contact. <laughs> and then it's always the same person in the front row who, you know, reluctantly, when it gets really painful, asks a question. You don't want to interact. So I think you lose very little interaction by putting it online. But you'd actually gain something by putting it online. You see, when you're sitting listening to somebody in a lecture, it is very difficult to think deeply about something because you either listen or you think. You can't do the two things at the same time. If, let's say, at some point you wonder about something, you know, your mind wonders, and hmm, does that make sense? And you no longer listen. 
you lose the incoming information. Our, our brains are simply not able to multitask that way. So therefore, we suppress the urge to think. We may take a quick note and tell ourselves, we'll think about that later. And some students, of course, do, but I think most don't. So, you know, and have you ever had in one of your classes a student raise his or her hand and say, Professor, could you please be quiet for five minutes? I need to think. Has <laughs> that ever happened in my class? But you know, you have to admit, if you really want to think, that's the only way you can. Now, online, you could do that. You could pause the video and think. So I think this is the point I want to make. If in, uh, education is just information transfer, then you know, we're doomed because we're going to lose our jobs. Fortunately, 92% of you, and I'm one of them, uh, thinks that education is more than just the transfer of information. So my question to you is now, to those 92, a lot of you here, what more than just information transfer is education? Your Create your own ideas? Let's hear a bit more. Understanding, which I think is sort of a hedge word, right? I mean, we, we hide behind that word without exactly knowing what we mean. So I would like to be a little bit more specific. Developing of cognitive habits. Developing of cognitive habits. That's right. That's one. Th well, I don't know if that's right. I mean, curiosity. curiosity. Although, frankly, I've watched quite a few YouTube videos that have, you know, or TED talks or whatever that that have piqued my curiosity. So that could be done you know, via, via video. Could be purely done via video. Passion for the subject, but again, I've been f often, I've been motivated more by some TED lectures than I was by any of the professors who taught me. I think that what we heard in the beginning actually comes closest to what I would say. What is important is that the students develop the mental models that permit them to apply what they've learned into a new context. Right, it's not enough to open your skull, put the information in, close it, and then regurgitate the same information back on, on the exam. Although I would say even an institution like mine, that's a lot of what happens. You need to really extract from that information the ideas, the models that permit you to apply what you've learned into a new context. And it took a while for me to discover that I was not accomplishing that. After teaching happily, living in this dream world of being a good teacher for seven years, I came across the Force Concept Inventory, which is a 30-question questionnaire that, as the name suggests, tests students' understanding of the concept of force. Now, for those of you who are not physicists, in a typical introductory physics course, force gets discussed in one of the first few weeks. And it's sort of a, a basic concept of, upon which everything else builds. You can't understand momentum, work, energy, everything. The, the whole scaffold collapses, in a sense, if you don't understand the concept of force the way it's embodied in Newton's laws. Now, the FCI asks questions about force purely in terms of words. Let me give you an example of actually a question that turns out to be quite hard for students. A heavy truck and a light car collide head-on on the highway. Is the force exerted by the heavy truck on the light car A, larger than that of the light car on the heavy truck? B, the two are equal. C, the light car exerts a larger force on the heavy truck than the other way around. Now, all students in introductory physics can recite Newton's third law. You may have heard about it, action is reaction, or the force of object one on object two is equal in magnitude to the force of object two on object one. In equation form, F12 equals F21. They know that all. But something mysterious happens when you replace one by heavy truck and two by light car. <laughs> they all forget about Newton's third law and they're convinced that the heavier object exerts a larger force on the lighter one. I read that. You know what's more, when I first read about that, there was a lot of data showing that in the Southwest, 
a number of schools in Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, California, they had done pre and post testing. They had given this test on the first day of class and then repeated at the end of a, a semester of mechanics teaching. And they showed that there's hardly any gain. In other words, it doesn't matter whether or not we teach them physics. I read that and I thought, no way. I learned this in high school, not my students. I thought there must be some kind of a disease raging here in the southwest, and surely in the northeast where we were, it would be much better. But you know, I'm a, I'm a scientist, so I've learned not to make assertions. So I thought I'm going to show that in my class, students ace this question. It took about three minutes for me to tumble out of my ivory tower, because hardly had the students began, or one student raised her hand. I walked up to her, and she looked at me, and she said, Professor Mazur, how should I answer these questions? According to what you taught me, or according to the way I usually think about these things? <laughs> I stared at her in disbelief. <laughs> I had no idea what she was referring to, and by the time the test had been completed, I'd been dragged out of my ivory tower. Now, my first reaction was, Eric, maybe you should just teach graduate courses. <laughs> but the solution sort of presented itself serendipitously. You see, not only was I shocked by how poorly my students had done, it was clear that you know, 60% of my students were still Aristotelian thinkers in their minds connecting force to velocity, not force to acceleration. In fact, some students managed to score below the level that a gorilla would score by pressing random keys <laughs> because they consistently chose the wrong answers. Some Harvard students belong in the primate section of the zoo, apparently. <laughs> anyway, so not only was I shocked, the students were shocked too. They couldn't believe that they'd done so poorly on this test. And you know, it was only a few weeks away from the final exam, so they were worried. So they asked me for a special session where it goes through every single question of this uh, test. And I remember coming to this question of the heavy truck and the light car. So I drew a free body diagram of the light car on one side, and the heavy truck on the other, forces of gravity on each, the normal forces up from the road, and then I drew the force of the car on the truck and the truck on the car, and I turned around and I said, by Newton's third law, these two forces are the same. I looked around, and I could see from the expression on their faces that they were confused. So I said, is there a question? They were so confused they could not articulate a question. So I thought, maybe they're confused by the fact that the forces are the same, but the effects are different because the truck is so much heavier than the car. So I should bring in not just Newton's third law, but Newton's second law and work out the accelerations and show that the accelerations of the two are different. How can the two be different since they're locked together? That might also be a mental obstacle. So I thought, well, I need to work out the kinematics too. Anyway, in the next eight minutes, with my back turned to them, I managed to give the most brilliant explanation you could possibly imagine. I mean, <laughs> the entire board was covered with equation, Newton's second law, Newton's third law. I mean, I'd worked out everything. After eight minutes, I turned around, you know, my, my jacket covered in chalk dust, only to see that they looked even more confused. <laughs> and they could still not really articulate a coherent question. I knew, however, that half of them had given the right answer. I had about 250 students at that time. And so in a moment of despair, really despair, I said, why don't you just discuss it with each other? And something happened I had never seen. Complete chaos. <laughs> they all broke out in arguments. I mean, they forgot about me in front of the classroom. I could have walked away. They would not have noticed it. What's more? In just two minutes, they figured it out. I thought, how can that be, right? I, the expert, have tried for 10 minutes unsuccessfully to explain it, and in just two minutes, they figured it out? Well, imagine you have two students sitting next to each other, Mary and John. Mary has the right answer because she understands it. John does not. On average, I will not claim that's always true, but on average, Mary is more likely to convince John than the other way around, simply the force of logic. But that's not the important point. The important point is this. Mary is more likely to convince John 
than Professor Mazur in front of the class. Why? Because she's only recently learned it. She still knows what the difficulties are that the beginning learner has. It's not that long that she has struggled with that same subject. Whereas Professor Mazur there learned it such a long time ago. To him, it's so clear that he cannot even understand why somebody doesn't understand it. It's what my, my colleague Steven Pinker calls the curse of knowledge. It's kind of an ironic statement, right? Because you tend to believe the more of an expert, the better positioned you are to explain it. But we forget. We forget our own struggles. We clarify the argument in our head more and more to the point of it becoming trivial, not seeing the mental obstacles anymore. So I saw this, I thought, wow. Is there a way that I can bring this into my teaching? And I started to see, I started to see education as a two-step process. I mean, we need information transfer, right? No information transfer, no education, but that's not enough. We need to give students an opportunity to assimilate. Piaget would have called it accommodate the information, right? In other words, extract from it the mental models connected to your previous knowledge and experiences. Now, in the standard approach to teaching, all of the emphasis in class is on that first step. And then the students are sent home to make sense of the information out of class. Ask yourself, where did you have the aha moments? Oh, I get it. Did it happen while you were sitting in a classroom like this, listening to people? Maybe occasionally. But I think most of it, I see quite a few people shake no. It happened outside of the classroom. But we became professors. Most of our students don't. In a steady state situation, we're all entitled to one, one of our students becoming a professor. Otherwise, the world would be pretty quickly covered with professors. <laughs> now, if you ask yourself, which of those two steps is the hardest one, I think we all agree it's the second one. That's what we should really focus on. That's where we should be there as instructors to help our students. Yet we put all of the effort on the first step. So back in 1991, I thought, I need to really invert this. I didn't call it flipped classroom. That's a term that came somebody else thought of much later. I think it's a great term, but although people have different conceptions of what that means. But I thought, we, I need to really invert this. I need to do one out of class. Let my students read the notes or the book, or whatever, so that I can be there in class to help them. Then the big question becomes, what do you do in the classroom? I don't want to talk about the first point now. I'll talk about that in a moment. What do you do in the classroom if your students have taken the responsibility for the easier of the two steps, which is the information transfer? The answer to this question is nothing new. Teach by questions rather than by telling. Who said that first? Socrates, 2,000 years ago. And here we're in the 21st century, and we're still mostly teaching by telling rather than by questioning. So I'll talk a few minutes, put a question on the screen. After I put the question on the screen, I give students time to think. It's quiet. They think. I, in fact, I do not want them to talk. I, if they talk to each other, I say, if you say something to your neighbor, I will come to you with this microphone, and you'll have to tell everybody what you just told your neighbor. They're quiet. Then I polled them. We, initially, we didn't use clickers. We used basically fingers on the chest and, and, and the hand as a cheap clicker. This still gives you privacy, right? Because you can't see what the person in front of you votes. But I can still get a reasonable idea of the distribution. And then I tell them, turn to your neighbor, find a neighbor who has a different answer, and try to convince that person that you're right and he or she is wrong. Chaos. And after about two or three minutes, I poll them again. Now, if during the first poll, there is between 30 and 70% correct or desired answers, I do this, this, the, the last two steps. If they're less than 30%, it doesn't make much sense to have them talk to each other because there are not enough people in the room to teach others. If it's more than 70, that means a lot of students will be off task because they're going to start talking about other things. So I try to aim it so it's between 30 and 70. And, and then we wrap up with an explanation. But of course, the learning, the aha moments, the, oh, 
oh, take place during that discussion. In fact, that's probably one of the most gratifying things. You see them talk and gesticulate, and you see students go, oh, yeah. All the, you know, left and right in that discussion, something you could never accomplish if you're one on many. Let me show you a little video of how this works in, in practice. So we have a rectangular So I start by, uh, by reading the question with them. Field and the um, indicated by these arrows. And um, so the question is, just to make sure they understand the what question. What are the magnetic forces on the four different sides of this loop? So take a minute to think about this, and then enter your answers. And again, uh, it's silent. Uh, it almost sounds like an exam, although there's no credit or anything. Okay, please enter your answers. I can see on my screen what the distribution is, but I do not share it with them. Disagreement clearly here. They so don't turn see to your that. Turn and see if you can convince one another of the correct choice. Right. It goes out of the page and the top goes in, so right. they cancel each other out. There is a torque. There is a torque. How do you know that? I said torque. What did you say? Yeah. But how can it be a torque? Oh. Did you see the aha moment there? Initially, we had sort of an even split, and now we have an absolutely overwhelming majority for choice number two. The and it's not unusual to go from 50-50 to almost everybody away. correct. That, that, that happens quite, uh, quite a bit. I do show the second distribution, not the first one. So what is going on here? One is it's active, not passive. Right? I mean, uh, even my lecture now is mostly passive. You're sitting there observing. And in fact, you can't sleep through my lectures because every few minutes, your neighbor would start talking to you. <laughs> the second thing, it's a two-way flow of information. There's not only information going from me to the students, it's information coming back. If they don't get something, I see it then and there. Secondly, thirdly, I, I mean, um, it is continuous feedback to the students on their learning. They, too, get feedback without any threat of losing points or anything, because I never give credits for getting it right or wrong, or even for participation. It's purely for intrinsic motivation, not extrinsic. So let's say that in that question that you just saw, you're one of the 10% you know, that still gets it wrong after the discussion. You know, oh, I better look at this, because most of my classmates get this. So it's continuous feedback without the threat of losing points. The third thing, it personalizes instruction. Student A can help student B. Student C can help student D, even though B and D had two very different problems. As an instructor, I can't do that. I can provide one, maybe two points of view, but I can certainly not help everybody with their individual problem. Do you want to try it? I, I'd, ha I'd expect a little bit more enthusiasm. <laughs> or are you worried that you didn't do your uh, work before class? But I'd asked uh, Cassandra to hand out these uh, two paragraphs on thermal expansion. <laughs> Did you all read that? See, you need to read before coming to my... I'm just joking. I see Cassandra getting very nervous there. But <laughs> and, you know, this, in order to make this work, I will need to lecture you, which actually I'm quite happy about, because the one thing I miss from doing peer instruction is that I'd don't get to lecture, and I really love lecturing, so I'm happy I get to lecture you about physics. I chose thermal expansion because I know this is a mixed audience, it's not just physicists. But if you're not, a, can I see a show of hands, how many people are non-physicists here, just so I have an idea, okay, good. So, but don't trust the physicists, they might get this wrong too, okay? <laughs> All right. Don't take the answer on authority, that's what I really mean to say. Thermal expansion, by which I mean the fact that hard solids like wood or metal or concrete expand when they get hotter and they contract again when they get colder. And I, I really want to restrict this discussion to hard solids. I'm not talking about tissue or dough or anything else or, or liquids, only hard solids. Very important in engineering. You know, if you've ever been in a train at low speed, you may have heard this clickety-clack sound of the wheels as it goes from one section of the rail to the others. And you may wonder, why don't they just jam the rails together so that there's not such an annoying clickety-clack sound? Well, the reason is if you do that and the rail expands, there's no way for the expansion to go in the, along the direction of the section of the rail and bad things happen, it buckles. 
The same is true for large uh, steel beam buildings. So the next time that you park your car in a concrete parking garage, you walk away from your car, look down, and every 30 yards or so, or even less, uh, you'll see a, a rubber strip. There's a gap that's left in the concrete slabs so that they can expand, and the rubber is there so that it can absorb the, the expansion. Now, the reason solids expand is, is they're made from atoms. I'm showing nine of them here. And atoms get further away from each other when it gets hotter. So this is cold. And that is hot. Cold and hot. That's all you really need to know. But you may wonder, why is it that they get further away from each other? I'm not going to test you on this, but I'm going to explain it to you. The reason is that atoms don't sit still. They vibrate back and forth. And the amplitude of that back and forth motion is associated with what we call temperature. So these are cold atoms, and these are hot atoms. Cold and hot. Now imagine you'd be in atom, you wouldn't sit still like this, you'd actually shake back and forth, and as it heats up, you need a bigger amplitude, you push the people around you away, because you literally need more space. It's a little bit more complicated, but that mental model will sort of explain it. And by the way, it's not just those nine atoms that I've shown there, right? It's all of them, all the millions of billions of atoms that make up a solid. Cold and hot. Questions, anyone? I knew I gave clear lectures. Thank you so much for reaffirming that. But you know, I am not going to just hide this and then ask you, when, atom when solids get hotter, do they expand? Because A, the atoms get closer together, further away from each other. No, that would be me giving you information, you giving me that same information back to me. I'm going to see if you can take this mental model of atoms getting further away from each other when it gets hotter, all of them, and apply that to a different situation, so you might want to ask me questions. <laughs> Cold and hot. Nobody? Cold and hot. There are no stupid questions. I'm the one giving answers, so only I can make a fool of myself. Don't worry. And hot. Yes, thank you. Ah, it's very good. What happens if the atoms are constrained on one side and not the other? Well, if they're constrained on one side and not the other, then basically the whole material pushes itself off, right? So if, if, I, if, I, if this is a piece of metal and it expands, I'm going to greatly exaggerate. The two sides would come out, the front and the back would come out, and it would get higher. But if I put, let's say, something there, it would expand twice as much towards the left. If I try to constrain it on two sides, that doesn't work. Those forces that are associated with expansion are very large, as you can see in the picture in the background there. Are there certain materials that shrink? Are there certain materials that shrink? Not hard solids, but there are materials that shrink. You can take a rubber polymeric band and heat it, and it actually contracts. But we're talking about hard solids here. Cold and hot. Oh, just because I wanted to keep that other picture in the background to remind you of what happens when things are constrained. So there's no significance to the white box at all. Yes, now the questions are coming. Good, good. Yes? If it constrained to a point, it's very limited. Yes, it shrinks and shrinks and shrinks, and then it, it's limited by zero temperature, which you could think of that's not physically correct as you know, no motion anymore, but it reaches minimum motion at, at absolute zero temperature. That's way beyond what I'm going to ask, OK. <laughs> yes? Uh, we are the same amount in all directions, yes. Yes, so I've only shown a two-dimensional drawing, which should really be a three-dimensional drawing. OK, good. One more question, and then we go. Ah, I was waiting for that question. Thank you. I was worried I'd cut it off too soon. What about the atom in the middle there? It doesn't move. I'm going to give you an answer which you are not going to like. Here is the answer. I made two drawings. I made this drawing, and I made that drawing, and I slapped the two drawings on top of each other, centering it on the middle atom. That's why the center atom doesn't move. <laughs> no, you're laughing. It's serious. I mean, that was a choice. I could equally well have centered, uh, uh, sorry, not centered, but put this black atom on that gray atom. In that case, what would have happened to this one? It would have moved 
down and to the right. And this one, instead of moving up, would have moved towards the right. And this one, instead of moving to the left, would have moved down. The point not is the position of an individual atom, the fact is that they all end up further away from each other, and that's independent of that choice. Remember, in a real solid, there are not nine atoms, there are not nine million atoms, there are not nine billion atoms, there are not nine billion billion atoms, there are not nine billion 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 atoms, no, there's just an incredible amount of atoms. <laughs> all right, I get tired just saying it, right? And the position of any one atom doesn't matter. Very good question, thank you for asking. I think you're ready. So here are the instructions. I'm gonna ask you the question, and you're gonna think about it without talking to anybody, okay? If, you, if I hear people talk, I'm gonna come to you and... <laughs> Good. Then I'm gonna ask you to select an answer, and once you've selected an answer, or once I tell you, you have to find somebody with a different answer. So if you turn to the right, the person has the same answer, you say, thank you very much, you turn to the person on the left. You're, if both people have the same answer, you talk to somebody in front or behind, or you climb over the seats, you have to find somebody with a different answer. Because if you don't find anybody and you just sit there, I will come and talk to you. <laughs> okay? So here we go. Consider a rectangular metal plate with a circular hole in it. How can there be already somebody who's answered the question? <laughs> I haven't even put the choices up. <laughs> when we uniformly heat this plate, what happens to the diameter of the hole? One, does the diameter of the hole increase? God, I haven't even read, finished reading and people are voting. Increase, does it stay the same or does it decrease? And if you're one of the uh, 18 smart people who have already answered, ask yourself, how am I going to explain this to the person sitting next to me? Who needs more time to think? We are at 95 here. Raise your hand if you want more time to think, okay. We have a few people who want more time to think. I can't promise I'll go on forever like this, but I'll give you a little bit more time. Are you okay, voting? Okay, so next three, five seconds, enter your answer. And look, I if you don't know, uh, don't worry. It's, it's your, 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 your answer is not going to affect any. It's not going to affect your salary or... It <laughs> I, don't, I don't keep track of answers, you know. I, we haven't recorded where we put the clickers with different ID numbers, so we can't even track you down, okay? Just make it a game, but you have to press a button. Okay, so now your task is to find somebody who's a different answer and uh, try to convince that person. Go ahead, talk to your neighbor. Now look at this, you all got fired up. <laughs> I bet that by now most of you have forgotten that I am not here to talk about thermal expansion. <laughs> you already made the point that I wanted to make, that you know, your mind has completely shifted here to something that is not even relevant to, look at them there, they're still, they're still. <laughs> It's okay, it's okay, it's okay, okay? <laughs> They're still gesticulating there. <laughs> Imagine I'd given you the same little lecture I gave a minute ago, but then instead of asking you the question, I would have said, 
Let's now apply this to rectangular metal plates with circular holes in it. If you take one of these plates and put it in the oven, the plate expands and the diameter of the hole will... I'm going to keep you in suspense a little bit longer. <laughs> I mean, you would have been sleeping. I mean, let's face it, what is more boring than rectangular plates with circular holes in it? <laughs> Isn't it amazing how you can reawaken the curiosity of the human mind? I mean, take a small child. I know many of you have or have had small children. I mean, we're all born curious scientists in a sense. We want to understand. We, we, we're pestering our parents and our teacher asking, why, 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 why? If anything, education does a really good job turning that innate curiosity off. The good thing, the good news, is that I've just shown to you how easy it is to turn it back on. Just ask it as a question rather than just telling. Now, before I tell you the answer, let's analyze what happened here. I asked you the question, you thought about it, and then I had you make a commitment at no risk. Remember? No risk. And for the students, the same thing. No risk. Then you had to turn to a neighbor and you had to externalize your answer. And something interesting happened. I could see it. It was no longer about the answer. It was about how you got to the answer. It was about the reasoning. It puts the thinking and the reasoning back into the classroom. And the most important thing of all is you became emotionally involved, invested in the learning process. If I were to tell you now, hey, there's food and drinks outside, let's go, you'd say, no, 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 tell us what the answer is. You'd come running after me. Okay, well, before I can give you the answer, you have to vote again. So I want you to vote a second time, indicating what you now believe to be the correct answer. Ten seconds to do that. Even if you've not changed your mind, I want you to vote again. Oh. <laughs> I have some bad news for you. I thought I gave a pretty clear lecture about, <laughs> and I'm at Caltech too. <laughs> Only 50% gave the right answer the first time. I, you should have done your reading before coming to my, 50% uh, <laughs> is sort of enough, means one out of two, but let's see what happened. The correct answer is, look at that, everybody's looking at me. <laughs> I mean, there's not one person texting or tweeting or, you know, there are no laptops open. It's just amazing. Well, there's one there, but she's not looking at her laptop. <laughs> All right, the right answer, I need a drum roll here. The right answer is number one. Hey. I went from 50 so percent. I mean, they went up, but they went up. And you see that the biggest misconception, number three, went actually down, so the process worked somewhat. I've learned one thing. For professors, it's much harder to change their mind than it is for students. <laughs> now, I don't want you to be lying awake in bed tonight at 2 a.m., you know. <laughs> so, so let me take a minute of my precious time here because we need to wrap up pretty soon. Although I briefly want to talk about the out-of-class component. Let's imagine you have a jam of jar in the refrigerator. It's a, it's a glass jar. Sorry, a jar of jam. I'm getting tired here. A jar of jam, marmalade, whatever, in the refrigerator. It's a glass jar, a metal lid that is one of these rings and a plate. You take it out, you can't open it. What do you do? You run the lid under hot water. The ring becomes bigger. The opening in the ring becomes bigger. He said, well, you didn't ask about a ring. You asked about a metal plate, <laughs> rectangular plate. OK. Imagine we have a metal plate. I'll use this conveniently. No hole in it. Now we draw a circle. And we put the plate with the circle in the oven. The plate expands. And what happens to the diameter of the circle? It gets bigger. Everything gets bigger. The plate gets bigger. So the circle gets bigger, too. You say, that's unfair. There was no hole. 
if there had been a hole, then the atoms would expand into the hole. Let me show you what's wrong, and we can try it if you want when we're outside there having some drinks after this. Let's imagine we all go outside, we hold hands, forming a big circle. We are the atoms at the edge of the rim. Can you imagine that? We're all holding hands, big circle. Now we step in towards the center of the circle. What just happened behind, b to the distance between us? Got smaller. I don't, they're arguing there still about this question. It's <laughs> marvelous. It gets smaller, right? It can't get smaller because we need more space. The only, way to make, the only way to make more space is to take a few of us away, but atoms don't disappear, or to make the whole larger. You won't forget this. <laughs> okay, so the first time that I implemented this approach to teaching, I doubled the learning gain. And then by asking better questions in class, I tripled it. And you know, the method has been adopted by many, many other disciplines and in many, many different settings. And there's an abundance of data showing that by teaching through questioning, you achieve so much more, including better retention. So I want to use the, last, use the last five minutes to briefly discuss something else, because essentially I've killed this, right? I've killed the information transfer. But still, you need information transfer. So how do you effectively transfer the information out of class? Initially, I thought, you know, I've recorded all of my lectures. I did that already in the late 80s. I recorded them, and in the early 90s, I started putting them online. I said, let's just have the students watch the old lectures. But then I realized that the transfer pace from a video is set by the speaker again, the same thing as in a lecture. And yes, a viewer could pause the video and think, but you know what? Students do the opposite. They put the playback speed at 1.2 or 1.3. <laughs> Look at the edX data. I have not seen the Coursera data, but edX clearly shows that. They want to get through it as fast as they can. Plus, the viewer is still passive. Also, the viewing attention tanks as time passes. You can see that in the beginning, they, they, they look at the whole video, but after you know, a few weeks, they find out that they can just fast forward and then just answer the multiple choice questions randomly at the end and, and sort of satisfy their reading requirement. And also, it's an individual, isolated experience. So in essence, what we're basically doing is we're moving this out of the classroom <laughs> so that we don't see it. <laughs> so then I thought, Let's use the book. Well, one of the good things about a book is the transfer pace is set by the reader, right? Because when you need to think, you stop reading automatically. You have no choice. And you can reread if that. And also, you're active because you're busy decoding the printed word on the, on the page. However, it's still an isolated individual activity, and there's no real accountability. Yes, you could ask some multiple choice questions, but what are they really going to tell you? And then it hit me suddenly that the solution was basically, because this is what we want, right? We want every student prepared for every class. That the solution was, without any <laughs> additional, <laughs> I'm a pragmatist. I love education, but I, I, I still have a, another life next to it, too. So without additional instructor effort. And then it hit me, the thing to do is to make that out-of-class component social, too. So the idea, and, and this is a platform I'm going to briefly show, and uh, that, that permits me now to claim that I can get every student prepared for every class. And at the heart, it's basically an e-reader that is an annotator, but it's a social document uh, um, annotation platform. So students read the book, and if they don't understand it, they highlight it. But by highlighting it, they open a chat window. And the highlights are visible to everybody else who is in that same group of students. So after a while, the page will be, first of all, they log in through a social profile, so either Twitter or Facebook. So already, the entrance to it is not through you know, some regular course software, no, you're brought into the mental mode of you know, a social interaction and Facebook or Twitter, so your own social profile. Um, and then, so if you click on one of the highlights, you can see different students asynchronously talking about the text. I'll blow it up here. One student asks a question, knowing, blah, 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 and so on. Another student a little later answers it. And I wish I could show you all the features, but I, I don't have time. Um, there are ways to actually flag things as questions. The software will do it automatically, actually. But if you have the same question, you just click that question mark, and it's just like 
clicking like in Facebook, but here it means, yeah, I got that question too. And if you get an answer, oops, pardon me, if you get an answer, you can click this little checkbox and it becomes green. This helps me understand the material. And if others find it also helpful, there were two other students, as you can see, who clicked this, they clicked that same button. You can quickly navigate, that's nothing new, but then you can also quickly get a list of all of the annotations and see which are the unanswered questions. Which are the answers that my classmates have given that help me? If you're not online, you get a text message or an email. This is one that says, you know, a few seconds ago, you asked this question on perusal, but the person is no longer on perusal. So when you're no longer on, it sends you an email or a text message. Then you can do two things. You can just reply via email, and it's inserted in the chat. Or you can reply via text message, same thing. Or you can view the conversation, and it pops you back in the browser. Or you can say, ah, this helps me and it checks that green flag without you even going there. Now, we give the students a rubric. We tell them we want a certain number of annotations that demonstrate thoughtful reading and interpretation of the text. So in other words, if you highlight something and you say, I don't understand this, sorry, that's not worth any points. If you write, I don't understand this because on page 256 it says blah, 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 then at least we know you've read, you get one point. If it says, I don't understand this because on two page, page 56 it says this, and I thought that blah, 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 you reveal your thinking, you get two points. We give them a rubric so that they can see the, the evaluation in process and get an idea of how they need to annotate. And we do that for different disciplines now. They need to have a minimum of 10. We actually rate their top 10 annotations. They have to be on time before class, and they have to be distributed. We added that actually fairly late, because what did we find out? Students put all of their annotations in the first few pages, and then they say, I'm done. So now you can't get away. You have to have them throughout the text. We force the students, in other words, to read the text. With this rubric in my class, which has 60 students, I get 20,000 annotations in one semester. Think about that for a moment. 20,000. That's more words than I've written in my textbook. There's more ink from the students than there is ink from the author. So how do you do that? Well, that's the beauty. It's fully annotated. We use a, a, oops, pardon me, a combination of machine learning and big data analytics to process all of these things. And it turns out with short annotations, it's very easy. So it's a great book, which the students see too, but this is a great book that I see. I had to gray out the names of the students. It gives, I, I think it's hard for you to see from where you are, but let me zoom in. It shows the total number of annotations, the total number of annotations submitted on time, the average quality of the top 10, how they're distributed on a scale of 0 to 5, and therefore, you know, based on that, what the assignment score is. So, you know, and again, that's fully automated and, and instantaneous, but it's even better than that. Because we connect the pre-class and in-class activity. I can't read all these annotations. There's just no way. I don't have time. But I can press before class on a button, and it gives me a confusion report. It gives me the three diagrams or trigrams that yield the most thoughtful questions. So in this chapter, the students had the most questions on the right-hand rule, the direction of the magnetic field and the Earth's magnetic field. And it gives me three exemplars where, where other students says, I have this question too. So I can walk into class the next day, and I said, Thank you for your very thoughtful annotations of the text. I noticed that most of you had trouble with the right-hand rule, the direction of the magnetic field, and the Earth magnetic field. Let's look at some of the questions that you had about the right-hand rule, cut, paste on one of my slides. I don't show them this, this way, I just cut and paste it. Now imagine you have a student who annotated it, you see your own annotation anonymously on the screen. You go, wow, he's actually read my annotation. <laughs> And then I use their questions as clicker questions in the classroom. So what are the motivating factors here? One is it's a social interaction. There, there, it's fun for the students to interact. 
there's a tie-in to the in-class activity, and of course there's also an extrinsic motivator because it's fully automated. Here's what one student said in my class. I think the perusal app annotation is way better than just reading a textbook normally. I've been reading for almost four hours now and haven't gotten bored. <laughs> he, he forgot that I wrote the textbook. <laughs> A student at Ohio State in a chemistry class wrote to his instructor, it makes the book fun to read. All the other students on my floor are disappointed. Their prof isn't using, isn't using perusal because they don't read the book. And if I look at the data, here's what they show. And these are two older rubrics. And it's even better this semester, but I was too lazy to make a new plot. This is the number of students, and this is the percent, sorry, the percentage of the students, and this is the number of chapters out of 17 that they missed reading before the class. Close to 70% was the, and this was already a year ago, it's a little better this year, mi misses not a single assignment. If you add, you know, you're a little bit more lenient, you some students who miss one or two, and you add it all up, you see that 95% of the students essentially reads everything. But you know, sometimes they're sick or they, they, they can't read, right? So that makes us pretty confident in our claim that we can get as close to getting every student read everything before every class. So to wrap up, education is not just about transferring information. It's not about getting students to do what we do. We want our students to stand on our shoulders, do more. And I think for that, active engagement, both inside the class and outside the class, is a must. Thank you very much. We have uh, maybe a short couple of minutes for a few questions. Yeah, back there. Uh, what's your strategy for asking a question that like, sort of gets at that story that Kevin just said? Uh, like, asking about something that like, actually works well. So the question is, what is your strategy for crafting a question so that they hit that uh, 30 to 70%? So if you mine your own mind, it turns out it's not a good source because, you know, we tend to overlook a lot of the difficulties that the students have because we've thought about the material as teachers about the material so much more. So the questions that come up in our own mind are usually way beyond the students. We forget this or just in time teaching, which is another technique, but that requires a lot more instructor effort than what I just presented to you. But if you look at the confusion reports, you actually see the type of questions that are questions that the students have. I often look at that and read their questions and I go, wow, they're wondering about that. Right? Of course, I could go into the class and I could say, here's the answer to your questions. But it turned out that those questions generally see the good discussion in the classroom. Very good question, and <clears throat> the, the question is, are there data, I mean, you said statistics, but I presume you mean data, that demonstrate that this approach is much better than the traditional, or better than the traditional one? The, qu the answer is overwhelming, and usually when I give this talk, I show the data, but I was so excited about showing this new platform that I, 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 I took the data for the in-class component out. It's overwhelming. And you know, if you now go to Google Scholar and you type in peer instruction, in quotation marks, you will find there are something like a thousand or, or, or 1,100 peer-reviewed articles in everything ranging from veterinary medicine to physics to chemistry and astronomy, where people have done pre-post testing to actually measure the learning gains and also looked at traditional exam performance and found improvement both in conceptual gain and, uh, and, uh, and in, in, in more traditional problem-solving approach. Carnegie Mellon, they did, unfortunately, they never published this. They did a retention study and showed that, you know, the top A students, no doesn't really matter how you teach them, they, they, they're fine. You could put them in a closet for four years and it would come out <laughs> fine. Um, but sort of the average student reverts back to what he or she knew at the beginning of the course after just one summer. And I think it was Einstein who once said, education is what is left 
after all that is learned is forgotten. Sort of a very sad statement, but there's a lot of truth to that. So that study at Carnegie Mellon actually showed that there's much longer retention if you actually have these aha moments in the classroom. So there's overwhelming evidence, and one thing you can do is go to my website, see my data, but if you want to see other people's data, just, just, and there was an article, I think it was in Science about a year ago, that also showed a meta-analysis of all of the articles that had uh, appeared, peer-reviewed articles, that show overwhelming evidence. Oh, that could definitely be true. I mean, there's a correlation, and I, I don't want to, and I don't think I said that either, I don't want to imply a causation, right? Correlation doesn't need to mean causation. Um, you know, the bottom line for me is I care about the outcome. <laughs> I care about the outcome. You, you mentioned one point that I think we, we should indeed consider. Maybe the students just spend more time. I mean, look at that quote from my student, right? Spent four hours reading. But I mean, in the end, that's in a sense what my task as a teacher is. I used to be, in a sense, the sage on the stage, delivering sort of the, the source of, of knowledge and information, right? Which also sets an upper level that the students could ever accomplish, right? Because that's, you know, it's sort of hard to, to, to exceed that. And I think there are studies that have shown that. I see my role very different now. My role is not to be the sage on the stage. My role is to be the guide on the side and to basically coach my students to be the best they can be. Take the analog, actually, of sports, right? The coach is generally not somebody who can do as well as the people he or she is coaching. And in a sense, I think that role is something we should aspire to. I, I want my students to stand on my shoulders and to solve the problems I cannot solve. And, and I think that this is a way of accomplishing it. I, I'm not sure that I can give you a satisfactory answer as to what the causes are, but I know by measuring the output, you know, that, that it's better. Actually, uh, we're running very much over time, so we suggest let's take just a minute to let anybody or everybody who wants to uh, leave and join you know, say the outside reception for the full gathering. Uh, to do so, and if you want to ask, if some of you want to ask some more questions, please stay, and we can do another ten minutes of uh, question and answer. Is that okay? Absolutely. Thank you.